Shalom. Today we are continuing on our study on the Gospel according to John. We are reviewing the Hebraic things that we find in the background of the story. Continuing in verses 1, 4, and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Again, the author draws us back to Genesis. We see in Genesis 1, 4. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So there are many things that God divides, including the human being. In Genesis 2.22, it is written, And the rib, which Yahweh God had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto man. And then in verse 3.30, we see that Adam called his wife's name Eve, which in Hebrew is Chava because she was the mother of all living, and her name comes from the idea of life. So we see that the life was inside the man. In other places, we see what comes from the light, from the darkness. Job 12.22 He discovereth deep things out of the darkness, and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. In Isaiah 9.2 The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, they that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. So the light cometh out of the darkness, and it is separated from it. In verses 6 and 8, we are introduced to John the baptizer. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light but was sent to bear witness of that light. So just who was this man? We find out from his genealogy in Luke 1, 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiyah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So they both came from the Levitical class. We see that the course the family group that Zacharias served in is listed according to the courses that David set in his time in First Chronicles 24, 10, to the seventh Hakoz, to the eighth Aviyah. So we see that he was in the eighth of the 24 courses of the priests. One interesting thing you might find about that, if you look in verse 11, you will see that the course that follows Aviyah is named for the family of Yeshua. Some people would like to purport that John was an Essene. There are a few contraindications to this. One was that the Essenes lived a very restricted communal lifestyle, so it is unlikely, first, that he would have gone off by himself, and second, that he would have ministered to people outside of the Essene community. The Essenes also forbade the expression of anger, and uh, we'll see that John is a bit subject to that later on. It also seems that he would have been recognized as a prophet, first by his clothing. We see in 2 Kings 1.8, talking about Elijah, and they answered him, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishabite. In other words, he recognized him by his clothing. In Zechariah 13.4, and it shall come to pass in that day, that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. So it would be another indication of a prophet. And then in Matthew 3, 4, we see about John. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, a rough garment, and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Another characteristic of the ancient prophets is that they were sent by God. Judges 6, 8, that Yahweh sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith Yahweh God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Again, Isaiah speaks him himself in verse 6, 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said I, Here I am, send me concept of bearing witness is important to emphasize in the Torah, in Genesis 21, 30. And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, 
and they shall be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. So Abraham makes a covenant with Ficho about who dug the well, whose well is it, and they have a witness for it. Genesis 31, 48. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. And therefore was the name of it called Galid. And this is between Laban and Jacob, as Jacob is running away. They agree to certain parameters. Again, in Deuteronomy 19:15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. We see that John is going to be one of the witnesses of Yeshua. The word witness, as we hear in the name of the place Gal Ed, you can see that the witness part is Ed. This is spelled Ayin Dalet. These two letters in Hebrew, and beneath we see the pictographics. The Ayin is the eye for seeing. The Dalet is the door. So the one who sees the door, he sees which way to go, he will be the witness. Continuing in verse 9, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The fact is that Yeshua is for every man, and this is an element that was missed by the people of, of his day, and it uh, almost seems to be being missed by some of the people of our day. In Joel 2.32, it is confirmed, and it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. It doesn't say whatever Jew shall call on the name of Yahweh, but whosoever. For in, the Mount, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh hath said, and in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call, and emphasized again in Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith Yahweh that doeth this. If you are called by the name of yud heh the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your bloodline doesn't matter. It's Yeshua's bloodline that matters. He's the Messiah for the whole world. And I'm very sorry to hear that it's going around in certain believing Jewish communities that only Jews can be saved or no Gentiles can be saved until all the Jews are saved. A lot of nonsense. The scripture is plain. He is for every man. Continuing in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Of course, it is foundational that God made the world. Uh, we see in Jeremiah 10, 12, and in 51, 15, exactly the same verse. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. In Job 38, verses 4 and 6. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Rhetorical question. God is saying, I did all these things, and Job recognizes that. So John is distinctly drawing a parallel between Yeshua and God that the earth was made by them. He's very clear that Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh. But just as the people of Israel have gone without recognizing God, so people have gone without recognizing Yeshua. Isaiah 1 3 The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people do not consider. Again in Jeremiah 4 22 For my people is foolish, they have not known me, they are sottish children, and they have none understanding, they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge. Continuing in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There is a lot of discussion about the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim. We will get to that in a minute, as it's written in Genesis 6-4. But right here, and, and we'll go over this again when we get to John chapter 10, Yeshua answers the people with a verse from Psalm 82, 6. 
I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Hebrew, we just want to look at that. I have said, You are Elohim, and sons of Elion. So he doesn't use the term B'nai Elohim here. He uses the term the sons of the Most High. He uses this verse. They are accusing him. You say you're a son of God. And he says, no. Is it written in your law? I said, ye are gods. He's quoting Psalm 82, 6. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, then the scripture cannot be broken. So it's no big offense for us to say we are children of God. Why do I say children? Let's look at it. So in John 1, 12, where it says sons of God, the word for sons there is techna in the Greek, but the Strong's word there. The Strong's number is in the Greek, obviously, 5043. And that really means children. It's not so specific as sons. In the Septuagint, where it talks about the sons of God, and in Hebrew it says b'nei Elohim, here it uses the word for sons, eoi, from the singular eos, which means son, and it's a different word. Uh, the Strong's number is 5207. So I think distinctly they're talking about two different things. And in verse 13, he further explains the difference in which we're born. The sons of the children that we are, the sons of God, the children of God that we are, are born not of bloods, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So this is the only place where the bloods appears in the plural in the Greek, but it's very common in Hebrew especially if it's the blood of somebody, that that word blood does appear in plural. I think it's interesting that there are three different not conditions, and we know that we are not born by these physical processes. We are born by the Spirit of God. But there are three processes he means there, three processes he names, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. I find it parallel to the Genesis 12.1 where God is sending Abraham out and he, he gives him three places that he's leaving. Get out of your country, your kindred, and your father's house. So there are three things he has to turn his back on. And in the verse in John, there are three things that we turn our back on so that we don't look for a physical birth, but we're looking for the birth from above. Finally, in verse in John 1.14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word there in Greek for dwelt or tabernacled comes from the Greek word skenos, which means a tabernacle. And so we see it appears again in the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, skenos, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. And again in verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So the concept of the human body being a tabernacle, uh, Paul picks it up again, but we also find it in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 38, 12, my age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. He describes himself as being an old man and his life is a tent, a fabric. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night. You will make an end of me. So we understand that we live in a mobile tabernacle of this time and that is our body and that is how Yeshua came to live in a physical body, in a tabernacle. The root Shechen gives us the root for the word tabernacle in Hebrew, the mishkan. And so the first mishkan is a physical house of worship. God said, I'm going to make a place where I can live among the people. Exodus 25, 9, according to all that I show thee. After the pattern of the mishkan, of the tabernacle, 
and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so ye shall make it. So he gives us a shadow picture of, of a future event, but in fact, we also are tabernacles, and he's building us into a new tabernacle of living stones, that is what we are. So Yeshua had to come in the flesh as a tabernacle to give us the lessons that God would have us to learn as human beings who live in a tabernacle. As far as his being the only begotten son, a clear picture from Isaac, Genesis 22, 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Next time we continue, until then, Tosimita Inayim al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.